Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today on Central Booking, we're traveling to the land down under to have a chat with number one internationally best-selling author Dervla McTiernan. Dervla is the author of the new standalone suspense novel, The Murder Rule, which is set to take America by storm. Transfer law student Hannah Rockaby, young and seemingly idealistic, manages to secure a position with the University of Virginia's Innocence Project program, where she'll be working as part of a team seeking to exonerate a convicted killer. It's manipulation pure and simple, but what's her motive? Intent on restoring justice, Hannah isn't prepared for past and present to collide with shocking consequences, which cause her to question everything she thought she knew. Born in Ireland, Dervla, a former lawyer, is the author of the three-book series featuring Cormac Riley, The Ruin, The Scholar, and The Good Turn, which went straight to number one in Australia. She has also written an audible original novella, The Sisters. Dervla's fiction has been recognized with multiple awards, including a Ned Kelly Award, David Awards, a Barry Award, and an International Thriller Writers Award, and she has been shortlisted for numerous others. The Murder Rule has already won over some of the biggest names in the business, and you're next. Don Winslow called it diabolically clever, highly compelling, and deeply moving, while Karen Slaughter promised you'll devour it. And if you can't trust them, who can you trust? Now, Dervla McTiernan breaks down the murder rule for us in a criminally entertaining and informative conversation. I can promise you this, hers is a name you'll remember. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Central Booking. Today, we are zooming down under all the way to Australia with number one internationally best-selling author, Dervla McTiernan, whose new standalone suspense novel, The Murder Rule, is about to take America by storm. I think it's safe to say that. Welcome to the show, Dervla. Mm, thank you very much, John, for having me. I am so thrilled to have you here. This is such a great book, such a great discovery, and I think that there are going to be a lot of people in America who read this book and that are very, very thankful that you have others, even if they may not have read them yet. So, you know, things to look yes, forward to. <laughs> that's a lovely thought. I hope that's how it works out. Fingers crossed. <laughs> also, all right, so I wanted to start actually by asking you about the title, The Murder Rule, because not only is it really a compelling title, but it's a rule of law, it's a point of law. So can you tell us a bit about what this actually means and how it can serve as an entry point to the story that you tell here? Sure, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit I mean, I think probably some, a lot of Americans will have heard about it already, but if you haven't, it can be, it can throw you quite a bit. It's, the murder rule is, is refers to the felony murder rule which is a rule in law that says if you commit a felony and someone dies while the felony is is um, taking place you can be found guilty of murder now whether or not you've actually committed the murder yourself or not whether or not the murder was accidental um you know sometimes the link between the original felony and the murder seems a little bit shaky so Look, there have been some very extreme examples um, that I could give you. Not all of um, the cases obviously work out like this. Some of them would make a bit more sense. But some of the more extreme examples would be there was a young man whose friend asked if he could borrow his car. And he wanted to go to a woman's house to get his stuff back, something like that. And maybe there was some suggestion that the friend who was lending the car kind of knew he was going to break in and get it. Maybe not. Either way, that guy who lent the car went back to his own place, went to bed, fell asleep, forgot about it, and he was found guilty of murder because the friend who borrowed the car drove to the woman's house, broke in, there was a fight, he ended up killing somebody. Um, and the guy who loans the car was found guilty of murder. It was another very extreme example where someone committed an, a robbery um, and that person had been caught, arrested, handcuffed and put in the back of a police car when the police, police officer shot his accompl accomplice dead and the guy in the back of the police car was found guilty of murder of his own accomplice. So there have been some pretty extreme situations, probably because you know, police and prosecutors are looking for uh, offences that they can use to charge this person. They're stretching a little bit in certain situations. But for me, because I trained as a lawyer, and I apologize for such a long answer, but it's such an important one. Um, so the, when I was training as a lawyer, we were taught, you know, there are two aspects to a crime 
right? There's mens rea and actus rea. So you have to intend to commit a crime and then you have to actually do it. So you, in other words, you should only be really held responsible for what you do and what you intend to do. Whereas the felony murder rule kind of turns that on its head. You didn't intend to kill anybody and nor did you in certain cases, but you're still found guilty of it. And I found that kind of played right into the themes of the book that I was trying to write. Yeah, it's a terrifying prospect, <laughs> you know, especially uh, the situation where you told us that one person was already literally in custody when the murder happened and still was mm -hmm. held responsible for that crime. So such an interesting premise. Um, and so, okay, so now I'm going to have you step into our virtual elevator. I love to do this. Okay. And anybody who's watching is going to take a short trip probably up with us. I don't think we're going down or probably going <laughs> up somewhere. But um, if you could just give us the quick elevator pitch for this book, if you could break it down sort of to Ooh. its essential punchline, what would you say? Okay. So I would say The Murder Rule is about Hannah Rokeby. Hannah is a young idealistic law student. She joins the Innocence Project on the eve of their biggest case. They're trying to save an innocent man from death row. Um, and, uh, you know, at first glance, Hannah's exactly what you'd expect her to be, you know, really bright, bushy tail, trying to make a difference in the world. But if you scrape beneath the surface, the real Hannah is very different. She's quite a bit darker, a bit more complicated, and she has some dangerous secrets of her own. Oh, good. <laughs> That's that my cool. bitch. <laughs> and a beautiful transitional moment, because Hannah was my next question, because she oh. is really, you know, she's a terrific complex dynamic character and she has an agenda and this is not spoiling anything I mean we are as the reader we know this very quickly that she has you know she's manipulative she has motives that are a bit murky so I'm wondering if you can talk about how you went about developing this character because she does drive the book so you have to have a relationship with her love her or not you know you don't necessarily have to like her but you do have to find her in some ways either relatable or sympathetic which I am assuming can be a fine line so can you talk about how you established her character and walk oh through? it was so tricky because I, I actually tend not to enjoy a book where I really dislike the main character I mean there are one or two exceptions but in most cases I feel like I need to be kind of rooting for them and I knew Hannah was going to be pretty uncompromising and that can be difficult to relate to you know someone who's ruthless really and she is quite ruthless um but I need I knew at the beginning of the book that she was going to be both manipulative like but skilled at it you know she's good at what she does mm -hmm. and for such a young woman she's got a lot of confidence and she really can make things happen and I really had to figure out okay what kind of person so I also wanted her to have some kind of core goodness at her heart so that she's redeemable so I was trying to work out okay what kind of she's not just pure manipulation and yet she's developed these very you know skilled manipulation abilities so how did she get there what kind of what kind of background what kind of childhood would have formed a person like that and I always kind of start that way anyway John I, I try to find a character that I really have a very strong emotional response to and then I start building them out and I just sit down with my notebook and pen and work out, you know, what is it about this character? Let me just work out all the details. Where did she go to school? Did she have any brothers and sisters? You know, did she have any pets? Does she love this? Does she love that? And it all sounds very silly and, and surface, but it sort of prompts all these other additional questions. And just through that exercise, I start building out other characters, like her relationship with her mom, whether or not her father was present. Did she have close friendships? If not, why not? You know, and, and it sort of all starts to come. And because I kind of know the, you know, the context I'm going to place her in, right. that those two things together, the story starts to come. That's terrific. I have to say, she's such a fun character to spend some time with because you honestly, you don't know what she's going to do next, but you can't wait to find out and then to figure out, you know, whose purposes it serves. Um, so a terrific character. And I wanted to ask you too, uh, because this is a great book in the sense that there's sort of dual timelines. There's the present day action with Hannah and what she's doing with the Innocence Project. Um, but then there's also excerpts of her mother's diary, which very much plays into that. So that takes us back a few decades. Um, so can you talk a bit about, you know, how having those diary excerpts heightens the sp suspense of the book, but also when you have a complicated structure like that, how you again have to, you know, sort of plan and plot for that to work it all out before you walk yourself into a corner? Oh my gosh, it, it was so hard, I'll be honest. Um, the, writing the lower sections was one of the hardest exercises in writing I've ever done because it was so important to get it right. And I wrote 
I mean, I'm not just talking drafts, I would say three fully complete versions of those diary entries, like polished, you know, but they have to work on about five different levels because for reasons I can't really go into without massive spoilers. So making them compelling, like we've all read those books where there's a dual point of view and you're really loving one point of view and you're just bored silly by the other and you're just flicking the pages to get back to see what's happening in the other timeline, you know? Right, right. I really didn't want that to happen. So I was trying to make Laura's voice compelling in its own right and what's happening with her interesting in its own right. And it mattered to me too because like I spent a summer working as a chambermaid in Bar Harbor and as a waitress in Bar Harbor in Maine. And I, I, it brought back a lot of memories. And I wanted to kind of capture some of the feeling of being so young and being kind of out there by yourself and experiencing life in that way. Um, and yet in a very heightened way, I see those um, scenes as sort of almost notebook-esque, you know, they're just mm, right. really high blown romance. And that would really appeal to a young woman like Hannah when she first read that diary, she was 15 years old. And I was really trying to make it tailored straight at her. Um, so that's those are the things that were in my mind while I was writing it. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, John. I think I've gone on a tangent a little bit. <laughs> no, I think you absolutely did. But I mean, again, that's part of the fun of this book is the diary excerpts. They read very, very easily. They're entertaining. They're emotionally engaging. And the further you get into the story, you realize really how much subtext is there, which is great because not only do you have all these layers to the characters but there's you know layers with lay in layers in the book which I oh kind of like you're so love. nice thank you that's lovely to hear that's really nice thank you oh sure well it's fun to read and it really makes me admire you know the ability of people who can do that and do it well because you know if I tried god only knows what the result <laughs> you know <laughs> John it's doing. hilarious we, we get such credit because people only ever see the super duper highly polished version of our work and like people are like wow and it did this and it did that and you're like yeah but like that's draft 26 and <laughs> I had two editors who helped me get there you know so we we look really good but if you saw behind the scenes sometimes you go really that's your first effort you would not be impressed <laughs> yeah you know one of my friend writers once said and I've never forgotten it that easy reading makes for damn hard writing and I try always to keep that in mind because yeah. you know as a reader we read something in a couple hours that could have taken somebody a couple of years to write and then we're like okay where's the next one so yeah. I try always to keep in mind that a lot of energy a lot of work goes but that's, what we're, that's what I'm always aiming for I want it to feel like an easy read like I don't want you to see the work behind the scenes I want you to be you're, you're there to have fun you know and I want you to have fun I don't want you to be thinking wow she worked hard in that paragraph because you know? <laughs> if you are really then I've, I've if you're seeing that then I haven't done my job you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. All right, so you mentioned um, Laura, who is Hannah's mom. I did want to ask if you would talk a bit about their dynamic um, a bit more because it's a really interesting relationship. I think the mother-daughter relationship lends itself to a lot of things. I mean, especially yeah. Hannah is sort of in that period where she is an adult, but not fully an adult. Yeah. So, you know, there's the anxiety there. There's sort of the combativeness, but also an affection for one another. Yes. So talk about how that plays out and sort of how it reflects the dynamics of oftentimes real life mother daughter relations. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, from in the context of the book, I, I'm going to step super carefully because this is an area where I could give spoilers away. But there's at the, at the outset, you know, there's contact between Hannah and her mother who is back in, um, in Maine and Hannah is in Virginia. And you can tell straight away that there's a lot going on there. I mean, there's a real closeness. Um, and a sort of a an adult closeness and, and interdependence and reliance on each other. Um, and you kind of feel that there's a lot lying under the surface there. Hannah certainly seems to be completely dedicated to her mother and very concerned about her. And there's a relationship there, then you begin to realize, hang on, it's more, it's not really the way you'd expect it to be, which is Laura protective of Hannah, it's the other way around. And Hannah is working to protect her mother. Um, and her mother seems to be a very vulnerable person who's gone through a lot of trauma. And Hannah is there to try to, you know, you begin to realize some of Hannah's motivations are driven by her mom. But then things start to get complicated from there. So yeah. for me, it was, it was a difficult, interesting relationship because of that. I just really wanted to play with some of the perceptions that we have of people. I, I th just think that's an endlessly fascinating area, you know, where you, someone presents a certain way. I think as people, we think we're more rational and logical than we actually are. I think we think that we analyze situations and then reach conclusions, but actually we form our impressions really, really fast. 
And a lot of our own like natural prejudices and biases feed into that. So you meet, uh, you know, a handsome man with a nice smile who helps you with something and you immediately ascribe to him all of these personality traits and backgrounds and histories that he has not earned and are probably completely irrelevant. You know, or you meet a young girl, again, attractiveness plays into this in a big way. And, and you think, you know, this person is a good person, but they're not necessarily. I have a friend who's a writer, Candace Fox, who often talks about this because Candace says, you know, we, we think that like we see a newspaper article about some terrible person, a serial killer or something. And we see his face and we go, my God, he looks like a serial killer. But if you put the exact same photograph beside, you know, Australian of the year or American of the year, you'd be like completely accepting of that too. We think we know what we're looking at and we don't. And I really like playing with that in the context of a story. Huh, that's fun. And it's it's so true. We form these impressions and then we double down on them just because we don't want to admit that, hey, maybe we were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you, you know, you were talking about how ideas and impressions and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. A lot of times there's gray area there. But I did want to ask you just in general terms, again, not spoilery, but, you know, Hannah sort of has a transformative experience with the Innocence Project because she goes in thinking one thing about the project and the lawyers and the volunteers who run it. And then she gets sort of a completely different impression of that. So in broad terms, can you just speak about what that experience, you know, does for her? Yeah, because Hannah starts off, you know, she's a very cynical person, like she's really smart, right? And she's growing up in this post-truth world and she sees the degree to which people are free to manipulate truth kind of in a consequence free way. And she's disgusted by it. But her protection for that is she does what a lot of us do, which is adopt this incredibly cynical worldview, you know? And she's just, she holds, she clings to that because it feels like strength to her. You know, if I'm judging everything and being cynical about it, I'm strong and I'm protecting myself. And she turns that cynical eye on everybody. So she comes to the Innocence Project with that attitude. She cannot begin to believe that people are actually doing things for just the right reasons and that they are maybe actually just good people, that what she sees is what she gets. In Hannah's case, she's kind of the opposite of what we were just talking about. She's suspicious of everybody. So when she reaches the Innocence Project, she meets a guy called Robert Preck. And Robert is the leader of the Innocence Project. And he's someone who knows how to play the game. You know, he's very handsome, very charming, a little bit manipulative himself. He's not afraid to use the way the world works to move his agenda forward. And Hannah takes one look at him and just judges. You know, she just thinks this guy is out to self-promote. He's out to make himself look good. He wants to be, you know, admired. And that's all he cares about. It doesn't occur to her that he might have pure motives in that. And that he's actually just someone who is operating in the world as it is, not as the world he would like it to be. And he may be doing it for good reasons. So I feel like she goes, I've probably given some spoilers away there, but I feel like for her, she goes through a real awakening. And that was really important to me in the book, because I think it's a question we're all asking ourselves, you know, how do you how do you do good things when the world is so awful? (laughs) And how do you find the strength to do it? And is it even worthwhile? Because does it feel like a waste of time? And I kind of wanted to talk about that because it's something that's been on my mind a lot. I hope I, I come to an answer in the book. I hope it's somewhat satisfying. No, it was. And I loved that whole thread because it really is like sometimes you feel like it's just a really small drop in a huge, huge bucket, but it makes a difference for some people. Um, yeah, we, the, the alternative is that we give up, you know, and, yeah. and that's not an option. We just kind of go, oh, well, we can't change anything. So we have to keep trying and, true, right? and so trying to make the world else, better. We have hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> as long as there's hope. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I will move out of potential spoilery territory. Oh, territory, this is going to be like punny wordplay. But, um, (laughs) you know, this is your first book, or at least your first published book, to play out in America. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how place informs plot in your process. Oh, it's so important. And, And it was such a very different process this time around, because I, my first three books were set in Ireland, which is where I'm from. Um, even though I live in Australia, and I set them in Galway, which is my home city. And, you know, I was writing them here from very sunny Perth and thinking of very rainy Galway. And there was something about the distance that actually helped me really focus on the detail that sort of made those books feel alive. At least I hope so. Um, 
Whereas this time I was writing a book set in Maine and Virginia. I spent five months living and working in Maine many years ago as a law student. So that was kind of helpful. I only spent a few days in, in um, Virginia when I was on my way back from a book festival. I went there and I was so insanely jet lagged. I don't know how much I actually took in. <laughs> And I didn't get to go back because of COVID, of course, I couldn't fly back and, and do it, spend more time like I would have liked to just absorbing a bit more of the environment. So it was very much about trying to find those important details that form an environment and an atmosphere that makes something come alive for people. I do feel it's important and particularly important in crime novels, because I think sometimes we go to crime fiction so that we can travel somewhere. I mean, I sometimes feel if I'm, I want to, you know, I'm reading Michael Connolly, I know I'm going to be in LA, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm reading Ian Rankin, I'm going to be in Edinburgh. And I, and I just like the feeling of going to those places. That's part of the importance of the story for me. And of course, context is everything, you know, where, where someone is in a, in a location and the, the society and the culture, the story is based in forms part of the story every time. So it's so important to get right. Sure. Absolutely. And Again, this transitions really well what you're saying, but I wanted to ask you too, you know, you were very well known internationally and yet a little bit less so in America, though I think this book is going to really change that. But I wanted to ask you about the process of trying to break into new territories, what that's like, and then especially given, you know, sort of the complications of the pandemic where the rule book gets thrown out the window. Yeah. <laughs> there ever was one to begin with. I don't know. It's oh my God. There, I don't know. I, I, it's funny. Like, it's really exciting. I don't know what it is about America. Why America is always such a, I think because I grew up in Ireland, you know, and we grew up with American TV and American books. And it, it was always, I mean, and, and Ireland in the 80s and 90s, I can tell you, was not a very exciting place to be. It's a very different country now. But America always seemed so much bigger and brighter and more colorful. And it just felt like if you could, succeed in America, that was the big thing, you know? So having an opportunity to bring a book to the US and to sort of have that chance is very exciting for me. But of course you'd love it to be in a COVID-free year because mm. I, 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 I do get to come and I'm going to have a, a tour, but it would be naturally a little bit more constrained than it would be if we were not dealing with the challenge of COVID. So it's a bit tricky, but you know what? The interesting thing about it is we're doing a lot more of this that we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do Otherwise, you know, and that that goes for everything. Like, for example, I'm, I'll be in New York on a particular Friday where I'd be on TV in Ireland. And I would not be able to do that if this was pre pandemic, because usually TV shows just wouldn't take you if you weren't there live. You know, that wasn't an opportunity you could have. Whereas now I can be in New York and do something in Dublin or I can be in Sydney and do something in, you know, in London or whatever. So those sorts of opportunities are are uh, more available if you like but it's it's going to be very interesting i'm a little bit nervous about some of the questions whether they'll be very different in the us than they would be in in australia you know because it's going to be a little bit new to me well hopefully this is a good training ground but you know yeah <laughs> but it is funny <laughs> you, say, you know technology definitely has its virtues i feel like i've done more traveling international traveling in the last couple of years than I ever have before just by virtue of Zoom and my computer like I've been all over the place which is really really cool and it never would have happened before so I guess that's the other side the flip side to that COVID. Yeah pandemic. absolutely. All right so let me ask you this so your first three novels which I mean bestsellers shortlisted for so many awards people overseas love them but there are three books in the Cormac Riley series so this is your first really standalone novel at least published standalone novel I'm just wondering if you can sort of briefly compare and contrast how you write a series book versus a standalone and now that you've done both do you find that you have a preference ah wow that is such a good question I, I wrote The Ruin, the, my first novel, as a standalone. Like, I didn't think of it as a series book. I just, in fact, I didn't even, because there is a detective at the center of that novel, I didn't even intend there to be a detective. It was just a story I wanted to tell about these two children, um, Maud and Jack. And that story, when it was complete, and I ended up getting published, and my editor said, you know, Gerbil, I think it could be a series. And I was like, okay, whatever you say, I'll do it. I was so excited to be published at that stage. But actually, there was more story to tell, I think. And as soon as I started thinking like that, I kind of knew it was going to be a three book arc and that it would be I would have to complete it in that way. Um, so that was 
it sort of naturally lent itself to that. And because I read a lot of crime fiction, I read a lot of series novels, I was comfortable with that. And, and I grew up reading fantasy, which, you know, there's so many trilogies in fantasy that was very natural form as well. So coming to this as a standalone um, after three books, in all honesty, was a joy because I was starting fresh and I could do anything. There were no constraints. There was no backstory to be balanced. There was no one to consider. Have I already done this? I didn't have to check any of my previous writing or research. I was just like, woohoo, let's go. <laughs> and it was a joy. I really loved doing it. I mean, by the end, I was like, ooh, what else would this character do next? And I had other ideas, but I am writing another standalone. So I can't do, I can't make it a series just yet. But I really enjoyed um, the fun of creating something entirely fresh and new the fun of new physical locations. Um, even by the end of the Cormac Riley series, I was bringing him to Europe. You know, he'd left right. Ireland and he was going to other places so that I could just stretch my legs a little bit um, and, and play with it. And I think the real joy is that certain stories demand certain locations in certain places. And if you are only writing series books, you don't get to explore those stories. I couldn't have written an Innocence Project story in Ireland because it doesn't exist, you know, right. not really. So uh, to be able to take that story and really run with it meant I had to travel to America in my head. And I love having the freedom to do that. That's the great thing about being a writer. You know, you get to go where your imagination takes you. Sure. And I've said that must be liberating because now you've done both. You know that you can do both. And now you get to sort of balance like, them out. But that's great yeah. because there are <laughs> options and options are good. Uh, yeah. So actually, let me ask you quickly, if you don't mind, you know, you mentioned sort of your reading tastes and I was going to ask you about that. So what do you credit, to what do you credit your love of storytelling and how has that love of books, of crime fiction, of fantasy, how does that fuel the stories that you yourself want to tell now? Oh, it's everything. You know, John, it's everything. I'm sure much like yourself. I mean, our books have just been an absolute fundamental part of my life since I was tiny. And I don't know how I would have survived without them. I remember the worst bit was <laughs> the hardest moments of my life was when my children were very little and I was still breastfeeding and I couldn't hold a book and hold right. a baby at the same time. And it was like, oh my God, how can I sit here for hours with no book? And that's how I discovered audiobooks, thank God. But um, yeah, they've always, always been there. And I was a kid, you know, I was one of seven growing up in Ireland. My parents worked very hard. They're very busy. So we were left to our own devices a bit and no one was kind of, you know, the way we are today, we sort of curate our children's libraries. You know, we kind of right. try and lead them to certain books. No one did that when I was growing up. You just discovered what you discovered, whatever your brother had left behind. You know, if he, he my older brothers brought the books into the house usually. So it was usually fantasy and science fiction. And I think there was a great joy in that. I got to discover for myself what I liked with nobody trying to supervise or help. And the joy of story came to me that way. I read pretty much nothing but fantasy through my teens and 20s. At a certain point, I found it harder to find writers that I could fall in love with, probably just because I was reading quite exhaustively. Mm. Um, and I found that I was picking up crime fiction more and more. And then it just was the case that I, that was what I was reading more frequently than anything else. I think what I found there was what I had found in fantasy, which was, you know, stories with consequences and big stakes and characters that I really cared about with the best of the books. And so then when I came to writing, I, like, I always loved the idea about being a writer, but I just thought writers were sort of magical beings and writing magically appeared in the page. And when I tried it a couple of times myself and it was so awful, I just thought, well, I just don't have that in me. You know, I can't, sadly, I'm never going to be a writer. But at a certain point, I just to get the same joy and satisfaction that I used to get from reading I had to write you know I don't know why it just it just got to the same place that was so satisfied by reading that same place was satisfied by writing and so even though my early writing was appallingly bad and I would read it and just think oh my god it was still helping me feel that feeling so I kept going you know and oh, it's just been a joy it is still a joy there are days when it's really hard you're going back over something you've written and you're just like oh I can't even see it um, but it, once you get over that initial discomfort and you're in the moment, it's still the most joyful thing. I just feel so lucky that that's what I get to do. It's, it's, 
I'm just so lucky, you know. Sorry, that's painfully smug, but it is just a really good thing. Oh, I, I think that will give a lot of people hope, you know, that you work through that point where you're like, should I be doing this? I really hate this and nothing seems respectable to me. And then you reach that point where, like you said, it fulfills you and it gives you that love and excitement again. So I think that'll yeah. encourage people to sort of work through the slog until they reach that place because it's... I, I really would say oh. that because I, I think, you know, like if you're a reader and we all are, like your taste develops over the years because you've read thousands of books you know what's good and then you read your first writing and you just think oh that's terrible because you know it is but what you don't realize is that that iterative process will make it better like there are there is such a thing as having an ability but there's also a craft to writing there are skills and you hone them and you get better over time so I would say don't give up definitely if your early writing is terrible because it always is and in fact it's a good sign if you think it's terrible because I have to tell you the people who think that their early writing is amazing, it's not that amazing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now we've all been scandalized and disillusioned, <laughs> but it's so true. And you need to be able to like take that critical feedback and, and go on. Yeah, on. push yourself on, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, well, I think that's ultimately very hopeful. So there you go. Uh, so just a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind, and then I will let you get back to life and writing. Um, but, you know, we mentioned a few times that you are, I'll call you a recovering lawyer. Um, so <laughs> I think you were more commercial than criminal law. But I wanted to ask you, obviously, you know, it helps to intimately know the rule of law. But beyond that, how do you think that those experiences have best served you in the transition to writer? I think there's one thing that it made a difference with, like, as you say, I was a commercial lawyer. So I used to deal with these absolutely voluminous contracts. I mean, 300 page contracts, and that's before you get to the appendices, you know? <laughs> and you had to know that if I tweak clause 2AB part three, that is gonna impact 77D and 84.3. And I have to think of appendix one, appendix two, and then there's this, and the, so you have to be able to run it through and you have to hold a map of the contract in your head and have a really good memory in that way. And I always think of, have you ever heard of the knowledge, the London cabbie thing? No. So, okay. So if you want to be a London, a cab driver in London, you have to study what they call the knowledge, which is such a great name for it. You have to, it's basically about really understanding how London works. And, and so, you know, your way around, you have to pass certain tests and they've done brain scans and studies on London cabbies and they show particular parts of the brain is really overdeveloped. And it's the ability, this part of the brain that can hold this map in place and the, you know, the logic of it and the, how to get from A to B in such a complicated environment. And my theory is that being uh, that kind of lawyer who has to hold the map of the, the contract in the head has helped train my brain. So that when you're doing more complex plotting and you're trying to keep the whole story still in your head so that you know, okay, I actually need to change that character because this is going to feel more real or this is going to deliver me this moment of drama. But to do that, has to be a natural transition and that is going to impact this part and where he talks to this person and this and I need to change all that and make it flow so I think it's helped me in that sense my I think my my memory has been trained in that very particular way and I think that helps me with writing no oh, that's fabulous and so there's a perspective that you wouldn't necessarily think of um, together yeah. yeah I love that you did very generously already sort of offer up some advice and encouragement for aspiring authors. But one question that I ask pretty much everybody who appears here is, you know, in terms of a creative or a writing life, what is the best advice that you were ever given? And then the best advice that you were never given and had to learn for yourself throughout actually, you know, doing the writing or the creativity. So is there anything that you would like to add that you haven't already mentioned that you think people might benefit from hearing? I think so. I, I really do think so. There are a couple of things I think about. One is something I, I read a long, long time ago, and one is a sort of more recent realization. And the first thing is, you know, Stephen, books, Stephen King's book on writing, I think mm -hmm. is such a Bible. And obviously it's a much older book now. And he, I don't know if he would change anything in it if he rewrote it these days. But he, I remember reading that first in my teens or something. And he said, you know, don't write unless you have to write. Like, there's no point. You know, there are better ways to make money in this world than, than writing. Um, and he was sort of saying, don't do it unless you've absolutely no other option. And I think that's true, but not true. I think that there's more than one way to write. You know, you don't have to write for publication. And writing is a great joy in itself. And since I've, you know, I've been, I have discovered the joy of writing before I was published and I realized how much it was going to mean to me in my life and that I would always write. 
And after I was published, I discovered that that's still the best bit. It is still the best bit, the bit where you're writing down, you're, you're sitting here and the joy is there and the characters you're becoming something and the scene is unspooling. There's nothing in publishing like that joy, not even like your number one, honestly. It, it's just so deeply satisfying. So if you are writing and you're worried about maybe never being published and whether it's worth your time, I would say do it because you first of all, you never know and you can't be published unless you actually write. And secondly, there's joy in the writing itself. It doesn't have to hit publication for you to have the best bit. You've already got the best bit. So that's the first thing. And at the risk of going on too long, I will say one other thing, which is a slightly more practical um, for the writing. I think you can never forget that the most important thing you bring to the table is you. You know, we read um, so many books and some of them are absolutely stunning. And we read so many books on writing that will give us a lot of practical skills. But you are the only person who can write your book. No one else can write that book. And that's why that book is there. If you could write someone else's book, you know, they're going to be able to write that book. It doesn't matter. So you're bringing your emotional response to a scene or a situation or a circumstance or a character, your point of view. And that's what gives your book what people call voice, you know. Mm -hmm. So try to connect to your own feelings and your own thoughts and your own response to something. Forget about what other people might think and write from your own view. And that gives your, your writing a bit more confidence and and voice and and I think I kind of remind myself about that all the time I think it's important yeah those are two outstanding pieces of advice and not ones that are always repeated you know sometimes you hear the same or very similar things from episode to episode but that was outstanding um, okay uh, so Thank final you. question I promised you there would be an end to this and look, <laughs> well, we've made it but we're all sort of about mystery and suspense today so I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just leaving us with a tiny little teaser of what we might possibly expect next from you. Ooh. Oh, I have a story that I'm really excited about. Um, but I'm like, oh, is it too soon to talk about it? Um, well, look, the next one is going to be, oh, geez, is it too soon? I think it's going to be about two families and it's going to be about two sets of parents. And, oh no, I can't, I just can't tell, it's too soon, it's too soon. That's actually, I, that's I a really just, good teaser. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst it's the worst I know but actually I think it's a really really good premise I'm super excited about it but it's not written yet so I feel like no don't jinx it by talking about it what I will say is my my uh, I've got a novella an audio novella which is just out and so that one is if you have read the murder rule and you're looking for something short and a little bit darker this one's a little bit more gothic it's a bit different from my usual writing but if you like something a little bit a little bit um spooky you want something short to listen to, that's a good option. And that oh. one is about a man, a detective who gets a call from the daughter of an old friend and his mother has just been arrested um, for murder. And he's absolutely convinced she's innocent. So he goes straight away to their house and to try to help the situation. But st strange things happen from there. Oh, I like that. I am totally down for that. And it's finally reaching that point here in America where it's almost getting warm enough in Connecticut to, you know, go take a walk. So that will probably be my like first audio book of my walking year. Yay. Oh, yay. Perfect. <laughs> I can't wait to hear what you think. But in the meantime, people can check out The Murder yes. Rule, which is outstanding. And then Nerve Loving Tiernan, you will be like on all of our lists, I think, from now on. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me, John. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.